In this video, I'll present an overview of Windows Azure and the components and services that comprise it, as well as take a broader look at cloud computing technology in general and how it pertains to the needs of research scientists and data analysts. At the end of this video, you'll have learned the basic concepts of cloud computing, generic to all clouds, not just Windows Azure. You'll get a better understanding of the distinction between providing infrastructure, platform, and software as a service, commonly referred to as IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. So let's talk about this term, cloud. There are numerous related terms in the industry for cloud computing, cloud services, and the like. At Microsoft, the perspective is that cloud is simply an approach to computing that enables applications to be delivered at scale for a wide variety of workloads and client devices. There are a few main types of workloads that work well on the cloud. The first is when large compute jobs are only needed occasionally. In those cases, cloud works well because you don't have to buy a lot of computers that then sit idle for long periods of time. Many scientists and researchers with large batch jobs have exactly this use case. A second use case is when the demand for a compute facility or application service may grow at a fast rate, but the rate of growth is hard to predict beforehand. So-called viral applications have this nature. When a user base or when the demand for compute capacity doubles every month, for instance, it can be hard for IT to keep up with provisioning. If your application is hosted on the cloud, turning on some more machines in Microsoft's large data centers is just one click away. A third use case is when an application's compute needs are basically constant, but there's the potential for a sudden bump in demand. Scientific work groups sometimes encounter this when conference paper deadlines loom, or when a particular new instrument starts generating data for the first time, or when some new data set is first released by the government. Related to this unpredictable bursting is the use case of predictable bursting. This is when there are clear seasonal or time-related dependencies for the need for compute capacity. Examples include shopping websites during the holidays or actuarial and financial companies around tax time. Academic institutions see this when students are first ramping up during the semester or as they race to complete final projects. The point is that in all these cases, cloud gives you the flexibility to scale up and down as your application demands change, while only paying for the storage and compute that you actually use. Here's another way to look at the cloud services taxonomy and how this taxonomy maps to the components in an IT infrastructure. With packaged software, a customer would be responsible for managing the entire stack, ranging from the network connectivity down to the applications. With infrastructure as a service, the lower levels of the stack are managed by a vendor. Some of these components can be provided by traditional hosting providers. In fact, most of them have moved to having a virtualized offering. Very few actually provide a bare metal operating system. The customer is still responsible for managing the operating system all the way through the applications. For the developer, an obvious benefit with infrastructure as a service is that it frees the developer from many concerns when provisioning physical or virtual machines. This was one of the earliest and primary use cases for Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2. Developers were able to readily provision virtual machines on EC2, develop and test solutions, and often run the results in production. The only requirement was a credit card to pay for the services. With platform as a service, everything from the network connectivity through the runtime is provided and managed by the platform vendor. Windows Azure best fits in this category today. In fact, because we don't provide access to the underlying virtualization or operating system, we're often referred to as not providing a true infrastructure as a service. Platform as a service offerings further reduce the developer burden by additionally supporting the platform runtime and related application services. With platform as a service, the developer can almost immediately begin creating the business logic for a particular application. This potentially increases the productivity in a considerable way because the hardware and operational aspects of the cloud platform are also managed by the provider. Applications can quickly be taken from an idea to reality. Finally, with software as a service, the vendor provides the application and abstracts all of the underlying components away from you. Windows Azure itself is deployed across a global network of data centers. These data centers are massive facilities that host tens or in some cases hundreds of thousands of servers. Currently, Microsoft maintains data centers in four regions in North America, two regions in Europe, and two regions in Asia. As you can see on the slide, we also have a number of content distribution network edge points, which we can use to cache your static content and deliver it even faster for your customers. What you're going to see in the coming months and years is that the data center footprint will rapidly expand around the world, 
so you'll have more and more options for running your applications. With Azure, once you've built an application, you can choose where you want to run in the world, and we can move your workloads from region to region. You can also run your application in multiple regions simultaneously and just direct traffic and customers to whichever version of the app is closest to them. This gives you a global footprint and a chance to reach a bigger audience or customer base in new markets. Windows Azure is commercially available in over 89 countries and territories. Anyone within these countries can sign up for a free trial or paid subscription to use Windows Azure services to build their applications. Of course, the applications you build can be used by customers worldwide. They are not restricted to only the countries on this list. The advantages of using Azure are many. First, there's no upfront cost. There's no need to buy any server licenses. However, if you're running applications such as a SQL database or other sorts of proprietary software on top of Azure, you will need to buy a license for those. For virtual machines and websites, two of the many Azure services we'll talk about in other videos, you pay simply by the hour. You can scale up and scale down your solutions or even turn them on or off as necessary. The cost is scaled appropriately and automatically. Azure charges by the minute and by the gigabyte of transfer and storage. And all of these things are easy to price on our website. The evaluation period is at no cost. Now let's take a look at the Azure portal, which is the primary interface for managing, monitoring, and interacting with all of Windows Azure's components and services. The main URL for Windows Azure is simply windowsazure.com. To access the management portal, click the portal button at the very top. This will take you to a sign-in window if you have not already signed on. In some cases, you may be redirected to a main Microsoft account management page. Once you're logged in, you can see the basic layout. All of the top information is related to your account, like your account name, the subscription you're using, and things like that. On the left are all of the various components and services that are available in Azure. We start in the All Items view, which shows all the various services that this account is currently using. We can see their status and any associated software subscriptions. If we click on a particular category on the left, for instance, Virtual Machines, then we'll see a listing of just those items. Here are the VMs I've created so far. I can also click on Storage to see the storage accounts. If I click on any of these particular individual items, I'll be presented with a detailed control panel for that item. Here I've clicked on the storage account, and we can see there's a quick start overview, and there are also many options for configuring the storage account at the top. In the lower left, there is a big new button with a plus sign. This is where we go to create new virtual machines, storage accounts, services, and the like. Clicking on this, you can see that there is a nested set of menu items. The compute area is where we can create websites and virtual machines. Data services include SQL databases, Azure storage accounts, and HD Insight clusters, which is Azure's built-in Hadoop cluster technology. You can see there's other types of services and apps you can create in your Azure account. In later videos, we'll walk through how to create several of these items, including virtual machines, and how you can use them for data processing and analysis. Now, if we look at the top of the window, we can see there is a down arrow or a chevron next to the Windows Azure name. Expanding this, we can see there is a menu bar with helpful links to a pricing calculator, documentation for Azure, downloads, which includes the SDKs for various languages, the community portal, which includes the Azure blog and event calendar, and a link to the support site for Windows Azure. Let's take a look at some of these items now. In the documentation section, there are several very nice infographics that illustrate and describe Azure's architecture at a high level. Here are some of what they look like. You can interactively zoom in and zoom out to look at various pieces of this architecture diagram. If you're new to cloud services, this is a very helpful way to understand all the components that go into the system. There's also a link to the MSDN forums for Azure. This is a very helpful question and answer site with many experts answering questions at all levels of difficulty and detail about the Windows Azure system. On the documentation site, there's also a link to best practices. This is a very useful resource and contains lots of helpful information as you're designing a system around the services available on Azure. 
There are discussions of how to ensure business continuity as you migrate to the cloud. And there's helpful resources on capacity planning and scaling. The community section contains several things worth noting. First, there's a link to the blog. The Azure blog is quite active, with posts on all aspects of Azure technology and use cases. There's also the Azure newsletter. You can sign up to receive these newsletters via email every month, or you can browse the archives. There's lots of information here that ranges from fairly low-level technology concerns, like HTTP headers, to higher-level topics, like comparing the costs of Azure versus Amazon Web Services. The education page has information for teachers, students, and IT administrators. If you're an educator, note that there is a grant available, a very generous one actually, if you want to use Azure in your teaching and your research. In the middle here is a brief overview of the Azure for Research program for academic researchers. You can see there's a separate site for this, azureforresearch.com. I would highly encourage any research scientist watching this video to check it out and to think about applying for the Azure Research Award program. This provides researchers with generous grants of compute and storage resources. There's also a training link here on the Azure for Research page that lists the training courses available that Azure performs all around the world. You can see there are quite a few of them, so there's probably one near you.